So today I'm going to talk about uh, some of my recent work on using s dynamical systems and systems and control tools to, to provide some analysis and control synthesis for traffic in the microscopic and macroscopic regimes. And I'll be more specific as we, as we move along, right? So the primary motivation comes from intelligent traffic systems. Uh, where the emergence of all sorts of communication and actuation mechanisms is allowing traffic engineers to do real-time control. Okay, uh, So things like real-time navigation devices, uh, congestion pricing in Singapore, also in Los Angeles, where there's a feedback-based congestion pricing, smart, smart green lights that take into account uh, the real-time queue lengths at intersections and change the, the amount of green light that they give to various uh, intersections. Similarly, ramp metering and route guidance, right? And in parallel, so these are all uh, these are all actuation mechanisms uh, here at the level at, at the macroscopic scale. Right? At the microscopic scale, we are also seeing a lot of innovation in terms of autonomous mobility with connected vehicles uh, paradigm. So, so my, my objective today is to, is to introduce and, and pre present some solution to control problems in the microscopic and the macroscopic regimes. Okay? So let's be, start being a bit more precise. So in the microscopic regime, uh, you have the, the models typically keep track of the state of individual vehicle. Okay, so here in the simplest case, xi denotes the position of vehicle i, and uh, in general, this the 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 speed of a vehicle, instantaneous speed of any vehicle, in general depends upon the location of other vehicles in the system. Okay, uh, in a, in a, if the vehicle is driven by human, typically it depends upon the person in front of me as well as some vehicles in the neighboring lanes. But as you can imagine, in the future, when you have connected vehicle paradigms, this uh, this information structure could be could be complex, and in fact, it's something that you can you can you can design. So not only you can design the information structure, but you could possibly also design the speed following behavior of, of vehicles subject to of course uh, safety constraints etc right and the, the the reason why you want to do that is you want to maximize certain system level performance for example you want to of course you have to ensure safety that is cars do not collide with each other you want to minimize emissions okay uh, the the aggregate uh, fuel consumption by the by the entire fleet of vehicles and also you want to let's say ma maximize the throughput that is the rate at the amount of uh, flow that your system can provide using this kind of control mechanisms. So in this talk, uh, the first part of the talk is going to describe how the throughput of the ensemble of this, of this vehicle depends upon the specific choice of this function f, subject to a specific information structure. Yeah. So that's that's so at most uh, in the traffic flow community you go to second order model. So, but there are there are defined well defined first order models also. So that's that's of course a limitation, uh, but, but that's not a limitation. Get at is like what is what is kind of the physically motivating choice that would kind of why do you what is choice like some practical choice that may kind of devolve into this kind of a model for example. So if there is something like that. Right. So. So typically, if you are, if you are, so there, there are limitations. So this is definitely not the, so I write away the disclaimer, right? But the reason why, if you, if you're already at the cruise speed, then, then it, this is not, not such a terrible, terrible choice. Okay, but, but I want to make a disclaimer that this, a better choice would be a second order model. Uh, but, the, but the, that's one of the limitation of the work that I'm going to present today. Not in the sense that our tools do not apply to this kind of models, but the results that I'm going to present today are for, are for just for this one, just to keep things concrete. And there are, there are models in the literature in the traffic flow literature which only look at first order models okay so so that's that's the first part of my talk and the second part of my talk i'm going to look at the at the controlling uh, traffic from a macroscopic perspective so how do i change for example speed limit at different uh, links in order to do an optimal control so the kind of models that i'll be looking at will be macroscopic models okay so row here row i would denote the number of cars on link i uh, mu is the external inflow into the system through ramps, for example. R is a routing matrix. Okay, so R, for example, says how many cars, what fraction of cars uh, going from uh, want to go from I to K. Uh, and Z is the outflow, the, the rate at which cars can depart from link I. Okay, so that's that's a Z term. So it's a simple mass balance equation. Okay, now. Uh, 
in, in general, both the routing as well as the outflow have to depend upon your state of your system, right? So the way people make their choice uh, depends upon what condition they are seeing in front of them, okay? And similarly, the outflow has to satisfy some constraint. So the, the most important constraint is that the outflow cannot be more than a certain value. That's a physical constraint of your system. But these constraints are in general much more complicated than that. And I'll come to a specific version of the constraint when I come to that part of the talk. But the message that I want to give here is that the simplest constraint on the outflow is this capacity constraint. And in the current literature, there is no rigorous way of associating that notion of capacity to the microscopic behaviors of vehicles. And that's something that I want to uh, provide some rigorous results about in this talk. Okay, so having this kind of models, which are pretty standard for traffic flow, you can you can do all sorts of control uh, things on it. For example, look at stability, robustness, and optimal control. And in fact, in our previous work, we have looked at stability and robustness, which I'm not going to talk about today. I'm going to talk specifically about optimal control for this kind of models. Okay, so with that, here is a brief outline of the of the presentation and. Uh, I don't have to go through all of it, so feel free to uh, stop me at any point. So in the first part of the talk, which is joint work with one of my students, I'm going to pose uh, the, the microscopic model as a queuing problem. And uh, I'm, in fact, this is a new queuing system, to the best of my understanding. And we are going to analyze the throughput of that queuing system from dip, as a function of the car following behavior. That's the objective. Okay. And the two main points that I want to highlight is that we are going to choose a specific parametric class of car following models with the parameters by single scalar parameter. And with respect to that parameter, we observe a nice phase transition in the throughput. So that's what I want to highlight. Okay, it, can, it could have implications on autonomous mobility in the future. So that's something that I want to highlight. And more importantly, I want to highlight the fact that this queuing system could be interpreted as a processor sharing queue, something that has not been recognized in the literature. And I'll be more precise as we, as we get there. And depending on how much time I have, in the second part of the talk, I want to look at the optimal control for macroscopic traffic flow. Okay? There I want to propose some, uh, so this problem in its original form, it's non-convex, but we propose exact convex relaxation for this problem. Okay? And, and and then, then I also provide sufficient conditions uh, for, for getting closed form control for this kind of problem. Sufficient conditions on your network. Okay, so let's see how far how far we can go. So here's, here's a problem formulation for the first part. And let me describe that problem with the help of a, as I'm describing the problem, I want this movie to, to play along, right? So for simplicity, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to consider a circular road, okay? So vehicles arrive according to a spatio-temporal Poisson process. Okay, what that means is that every with, with rate lambda and spatial distribution phi. What that means is that according to a Poisson clock, which is running at rate lambda, a vehicle arrives, pops up into the system, and its location is sampled from this distribution phi. Uh, which is distributed over the circle. Okay, that's the arrival process. It's independent of the state of the network. So in this figure, the, the red dots are, are showing the, the vehicles which have just arrived. Green is the one which the vehicle which is just departing. So in this talk, I'm going to assume that all the vehicles depart from, from this point. So so at the, at, the, at, the, at the same point. So all the vehicles depart from the same point. That feature can be relaxed. The departure could be also random. That's not a problem. But in order to keep things tractable, I'm going to have only one random parameter here, object here, which is the arrival process. Okay? And when the vehicles are in the system, they follow this kind of car following model. Okay? So, so here the parameter is, is m. So xi plus 1 is the vehicle in front of vehicle i. And so the speed of the vehicle is going to be some power of the of the vehicular distance to the to the vehicle in front. Okay, so for any m and m is typically is not typically it's, it's greater than zero. Okay, so higher the smaller the value of m, the more aggressive the driver is. Okay, and well, similarly the higher the value of m, the more cautious the driver is. And all of these models, meaning for any m, have the natural collision avoidance behavior, right? So as the as this argument goes to zero, which is when the vehicles are getting close, the, the following vehicle stops. Okay, so these models have the nice property of avoiding collision. So my objective in this talk is uh, for a given m and for a given phi, what is the maximum lambda that my system can tolerate so that the q length does not go to infinity? That's the problem that I want to understand. Okay, so. Uh, I, so this movie, of course, will keep playing. But uh, so let me proceed with this. So that's that's really the the problem formulation. So I want my Q. I want to understand with respect to what lambda is my Q stable, and that maximum value of lambda I'm going to denote by star lambda star. Okay. 
So this problem, now this problem is, is too complex to have such a simple problem formulation. In particular, the fact whether your Q becomes unstable or not, not only depends upon the, the arrival rate and the distribution phi and M, but it could also depend upon the initial condition. Okay, and so I'm not mentioning all the important parameters that affect your, your, your quantity of interest here, because it will turn out that in some cases, uh, initial condition doesn't matter, but in some cases it does matter. And I'll, and I'll highlight those aspects when I get to those points. Okay, but this is the problem that I want to solve. So, uh, if, you, if you look closely, this problem uh, appears to be connected to many problems that controls people have been studying in the literature, right? And there are, the, the natural ones that come into your mind are consensus, string, stability, and platooning. So I want to take a moment to differentiate our work with, with that community. And the key aspect is that all those systems have been considering uh, this kind of problems in, in a close fashion where vehicles do not arrive or depart your system under consideration. Okay, so there's a clear, in the, in the, in the community, in the, in the literature on platooning and string stability, there's a clear notion of a leader. Whereas there's no notion of a leader here because cars arrive and depart. There's no central, there's no kind of central coordination per se. So all the car following behavior is completely decentralized. Okay. So if you freeze the system, if you freeze the arrival and departure of the vehicle, then the model that we are trying to analyze is very similar to, to many problems that people have looked at. For example, uh, this, uh, sorry, there's, there's a typo here, the M should, be, M should be outside. So this, for example, if you look at this system between jumps, this is what is known as a cooperative system, which is a special case of a monotone system that people have analyzed in great detail. If you look at the dynamics for the inter-vehicle system, so if you define yi to be the distance between vehicle i plus one and i, and if you look at the dynamics of that y, it's very similar, if you, for example, if you put M equal to one, it's nothing but a Laplacian dynamics. Okay, so that's very reminiscent of, of continuous, uh, of, of consensus systems. So in between jumps, that means in between arrival and departures, the dynamics have, have attracted a lot of attention in the, in the, in the literature. But our objective is just to go beyond, uh, go be, sorry, go beyond uh, uh, just be in between jumps. So again, uh, to highlight that point further, uh, if I want to compare our, our uh, system with uh, string stability and platooning, if you look at the Q length in a, in a string stability and platooning work, uh, th no vehicles arrive and depart, so the Q length is fixed, but that is the quantity that, that keeps varying in our system. It's a time varying quantity and the primary quantity of interest for us. And similarly, in our model, if you fix the arrival and departure, uh, then, the, then the system goes to an equilibrium, which is when all the vehicles are equally spaced. Whereas in our system, that, that intervehicular uh, uh, distance is, is a stochastic process. Okay, so that's that's that brings complication to our to our problem. So, yeah. yeah. So how, for example, how, how for example, people have looked at disturbances with synchronization or with time varying disturbance, for example. So here the time varying is very specific, if you may. We're very, so the, the state of the system, it's itself changing. The size of the state itself. It, the dimension itself is changing, right? So that, I don't know if you can formulate that as a, as a specific, uh, in, the, in the context of that literature. So, so, so natural framework to, to analyze this kind of systems, open systems where vehicles come and depart are queuing systems, right? And of course, traffic people have, have tried to analyze this kind of system using queuing theoretic ideas, but, but there are limitations, okay? So uh, for those, so very, the simplest kind of queuing systems are first come, first serve, uh, which, which uh, are used to model many real life scenarios, where there's a server uh, serving a, a sequence of jobs waiting in queue, and the key feature in, in for example, an MM one queue, which is the simplest kind of queuing system, is that a server services only one job at a time. Okay, so all the service of the server is dedicated to one job. And the sequence of jobs is first come, first serve. That is the job which arrived first will be the first one to, to, get, to get attention. Okay, now for these kind of queuing systems, uh, uh, first come, first serve, and an MM1 queue in particular, you can easily write the queue length dynamics. It's, it's not, very, not, so not very difficult. Okay, and in fact, uh, people have looked at the corresponding fluid version of this dynamics, uh, which I'm highlighting here. So the left-hand side is a typical stochastic realization of your queuing system, and the right-hand side is the appropriate scale version of the system. So not only the throughput, but also the, the dynamics have, have been understood in a, in a well, precisely mathematical sense. Now, this framework does not apply to our system. Because if you think of traffic as a queuing system where the role of the server is played by the road, okay? So, and if the, if the act of a vehicle moving corresponds to it being serviced, then all the vehicles are served simultaneously. 
So there is no one job being served at the same time. So the notion of, of this classical MM1Q does not apply to our case. But there are other notions of queuing system which are more suited to our queuing system known as processor sharing queue. Now processor sharing queue, which, uh, which is in some sense an abstraction for round robin kind of policy in, in many communication network, uh, it, under this paradigm, every outstanding job in the system gets serviced from the server. However, the amount of service that each job gets is inversely proportional to the number of jobs present in the system, right? So this paradigm naturally measures, uh, captures some kind of congestion effect in, the, in, your, in your system. But again, it does not apply to our case readily. Because if you apply this rule, then what this means is that the speed of every car is identical. It's equal, it's inversely proportional number of cars present in the system. So at some point, if a vehicle departs, the speed of all the speed of the vehicles have to increase synchronously. Something that's not that, that's not the feature of our model. Okay. So on our hand, on the other hand, in our model, the speed of the vehicle or the service rate of, of a typical job it depends on the state in, of the system in a very complicated fashion. Okay. So this is again to to argue that the process sharing paradigm does not apply to our case in a, in a straightforward manner. And in some sense, you can think of the queuing system that we are analyzing as a generalized version of process sharing queue. Okay. Having said that, let's return to our problem now. Okay, so our problem is to compute the throughput of the system with respect to different car following behavior. So let's look at, so the quantity of interest to us is the Q length, right? Because what we want to know when does that Q length go to infinity. So let me denote that by N, okay? If you, for a second, if you uh, are willing to uh, approximate it by continuous dynamics, it can be written, it's a very simple equation. The rate of change of Q is the arrival rate lambda minus the departure rate. And the complication in this model comes of because of the complication of departure rate. So the departure rate depends upon your state of the system in a very complicated fashion. Okay. However, there are other quantities uh, associated with your queuing system that are much easier to analyze in terms of their dynamics. And one such quantity is, is workload. Okay, so what is the workload in a, in a given, for, a, for a given queuing system? For our queuing system, the workload associated with every car is the amount of distance that it is left still to travel before it exits, because that's the amount of work that that car needs from the system. And the total workload from the system, of the entire system, is the sum of the distances that the vehicles have to travel, all the vehicles that have to travel, right? So because the departure point for a vehicle is at x equal to one, the, the remaining distance is one minus xi, where xi is the current location, and its summation over all the jobs is the is, is the workload. Now, why is this is this uh, useful uh, parameter to to analyze than the queue length? Because if you write down the dynamics now, okay, of of uh, of this variable, it's uh, it's nothing but the rate of change of workload is the rate at which work is added to the system minus the rate at which work is subtracted from the system. The rate at which work is added to the system is the product of rate at which jobs arrive into the system times the average work that they bring. Okay, so this is, okay, and the service rate is nothing but the sum of speeds of the vehicles for which we have, it's a sum of xi, xi to the, xi plus one minus xi to the power m. It's still complicated, but at least we can write down a course form expression for the dynamics. Okay, so, so yes, we workload is an, is an interesting parameter that we can uh, understand dynamics of, but does it give us any insight into the actual parameter that we are interested in, which is the Q length? So let me, let me show the relationship between workload and Q length uh, in, the, in this slide. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm recalling the expression for workload, the relationship between workload and Q length from the previous slide. Okay, so where xi are the current location of all the vehicles in the system. Okay, you can easily see that uh, from this expression that workload is upper bounded by Q length. Okay, so if I can show that my workload is going, I'm growing unbounded, then the Q length also has to grow unbounded. So if I can find an upper bound for lambda under which workload is unbound, that will naturally give an upper bound on the throughput of the system. But what about the lower bound? Unfortunately, the lower bound is, is not, you cannot easily relate this to quantities in terms of lower bound. And it's very easy to see through an, through an example. In particular, even if your workload is bounded, that does not mean that the Q length is bounded, okay? So consider a very simple but hypothetical example where all the vehicles are close to each other uh, with, with this coordinate, meaning that they are at distance one over n from the departure point, okay? If you compute the workload, uh, meaning sum this up over all n, it comes out to be exactly equal to one. Okay, and uh, that that is is independent of n. 
this quantity is independent of n. The workload. Workload is equal to 1 no matter how many vehicles are present. So again, the workload will be summation of 1 minus xi. 1 minus xi will be 1 over n. When you sum it over all on n, 1 over n times n is 1. So the workload is constant at this configuration no matter how many vehicles are present in the system. Right? So even if your workload is finite, your Q-length could be arbitrary large. It doesn't say anything about that. Uh, however, if your workload is 0, then the Q-length is 0. There's no other possibility. Okay? So if you can show for some arrival rate that the workload goes to zero in some finite time, then Q length is also going to zero. So it's that relationship that we are going to use to establish the lower bound, okay? Now, of course, this will be an approximate, both of this approach are going to give an approximation for the throughput of, for our actual system, meaning using workload as a surrogate for, for looking at the dynamics will be an approximation for your actual dynamics, which has to do with Q length. But we'll see that the approximations are very nice. And in fact, in some cases, they're exact. Okay, so let's start with the simplest case, the linear case, okay, when m equal to 1, meaning the car following behavior is xi dot equal to xi plus 1 minus xi. Now, in this case, if you write the service rate, it's, it's constant, okay, because you just add up the intervehicular distances of all the vehicles, and thanks to our circular geometry, it's, it's a constant, okay, let's say it's 1. So now my workload has a very simple, workload dynamics has a very simple expression, okay? And you can naturally guess what should be the maximum throughput of this kind of system, okay? It's when the right-hand side is, is less than or equal to zero, okay? When lambda times one minus rho bar minus one is less than or equal to zero. And indeed, indeed, uh, uh, although this was an approximation of your actual stochastic process using, using uh, standard arguments, you can indeed show that almost surely, no matter what initial condition you start with, meaning no matter how many vehicles you start with, and no matter what is the initial location on the ring, uh, your system almost surely, as long as your lambda arrival rate is, is less than one over one minus rho bar, your system will be, will be, will be the Q length will be finite almost surely, okay? So let me not go through the, go through the, go through the proof of, uh, of uh, that, that particular case, okay? So, rather than going through the proof, I want to highlight some of the key features of, uh, of, this, of this proof, okay? So our key feature was to, was to look at the evolution of your queuing system, which alternates between idle time and busy time. So this is what the typical phase of my queuing system is, okay? Remember, in order to show my queue length is bounded, I need to, the, the thing that I'm relying on is, is when my workload goes to zero, okay? Which is when my busy period ends. So looking in order to prove this such a result uh, in a stochastic sense I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating myself on a typical busy period and looking at the scenarios when the duration of this busy period is finite because once a busy period ends the next busy period is independent of my previous period because the idle time is 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 uh, an exponential random variable because my arrival process is memoryless it's it's a from a it's a sample from a poisson distribution okay so once we understand the statistics associated with a, a specific busy period then we have characterized the the behavior of my queuing system okay and thanks to the to the property that the service rate of my system is constant it's it's easy to analyze analyze the statistics associated with the busy period Okay. And in fact, what you show, the sequence of steps that you go through is, is that uh, you compute the mean busy period duration, okay? And you show that for, for if your lambda is less than inverse of one minus rho bar, then this expectation is, is less than infinite. And in fact, it is finite. And this, through standard arguments, you can show that the long run proportion of idle time, that is the, this blue intervals, is strictly greater than zero. And hence, because you have idle times, the proportion of idle time in the long run is, is not zero. That means there have to be idle time even in the tail, even at the end of the time series. That means your queue length cannot go, go unbounded because you, workload will become zero often, enough often, and hence your queue length will also go to zero frequent enough. That's why queue length cannot become infinite. So that's the argument we use. Okay, so in, in summary, for the linear case, the throughput of my queuing system is precisely given by this parameter almost surely. Okay, and this is the strongest possible result you can, you can expect because it's almost surely, and moreover, it does not depend upon the initial condition. Okay, no matter how you start your system, uh, if this parameter lambda satisfies is less than this, your system will be stable. Okay? Such cleanliness of the result, unfortunately, will not carry forward when we go to the nonlinear version of this problem. Okay? There we will have to be careful about the initial condition, 
Moreover, this results, such results will hold true only probabilistically. Okay, so the the, the results there are quite uh, quite complex. So what I want to do today is describe or characterize some initial conditions which are quite natural from which your Q will become, become stable. Okay? So I want to present the, the initial set of initial conditions under which probably the system will remain stable and you will see by simulations that they are very close enough to, to what you see in simulations. Okay? But let's, it's, before even we go to the detail analysis, it's, you can clearly get some bounds on the throughput for the nonlinear case based on your analysis for the linear case. Okay, so let's look at the service rate expression again. Because we have assumed the, the, the total length of the, of the road is unit, each of these yi is strictly less than one. And therefore, yi to the power m is less than yi if m is greater than zero, and yi to the power m is greater than yi if small m is less than one. What that means is that in the superlinear case, this instantaneous service rate satisfies this relationship. And in the sublinear case, it satisfies this relationship. Okay? So for the linear case, we knew that the service rate was constant was 1. In the superlinear case, you can, based on the argument that I just described, you can show that the service rate can never be more than 1. Okay? And similarly, in the sublinear case, the service rate can never be less than 1. And again, let me remind you, the, the sublinear case corresponds to an aggressive driver, and the superlinear case corresponds to a cautious driver. Okay? So, uh, and, and these extremes, so this extreme is achieved when the vehicular configuration is uniform. When all the vehicles are equally, equally distributed, that's when you have the least service rate. And you have the most service rate when there is a lot of congestion. All the vehicles are, are essentially back to back with each other. That's when you have the highest service rate in the system. And vice versa for the sublinear case. When, when the vehicles are really congested together, that's when you have the least service rate. And when they are, are, are uniformly spread, that's when you have the highest service rate. And in fact, this intuition will help us to construct these initial conditions from which your Q will become uh, stable with under, under strong guarantees on lambda. Okay? So, but right away from this, you can show that for the nonlinear case, almost surely the throughput has these bounds, meaning the, the throughput for the sublinear case can be no less than the throughput for the linear case. Yeah. So I understand that if two vehicles are very close to each other. Uh, they will slow down. Yes. Uh, will this imply that the ones that are in front will also slow down? Eventually they will, because it's a, it's a circular geometry. So if, if the guy in front of me, uh, if I slow down, the guy behind me will will also slow down, and eventually it will affect everybody because of circular configuration. But then there is a point at which the uh, cars are serviced. The, no, no, the cars, they, they depart, you mean? Depart, yeah. yeah. But, but it affects, so that departure point is virtual, meaning the, oh, it's virtual. So you, okay, all right. No, okay, no. sorry, I should have clarified. Okay. So that departure point is virtual, right? So, the, so maybe, maybe I should... No, 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 I, no okay. I think I understand. Maybe so, people understood that. So, so meaning this is a departure point, so even this, this vehicle is affecting the speed of this vehicle. Okay, so it's, it's everywhere. And that's why there's no clear read, leader in this, in this configuration, as opposed to platooning and string stability literature. There's no leader here. Yeah, but then, for instance, if you have a line instead of a circle, then you have to be careful. That, so then you would expect that the ones that are behind will get affected, but not. No, they're not in the front. Exactly. But again, this this is uh, arguably more. So this circular is not just, uh, I guess, it's not capturing any, like roundabout. I, we we actually wanted to. Uh, because every vehicle in real life is affected by congestion in front and back. And the simplest way to abstract that was by considering a circular or periodic geometry. You could, but we didn't want to... Circular and square is likely. Yeah, it's yeah. not circular, but you know, topologically. Yeah. yeah, but we did not want to really correlate this with, with circular roadways because what we are really trying to capture here is that there is no unique vehicle here. Every vehicle is being treated in the same way. Okay, so, uh, so these are the bounds. Okay, now of course these are bounds, and, but the question is, okay, for example, for the superlinear case, how small can I go? If this quantity is one, is, it, is this zero? Uh, is it 0.5? I mean, what kind of guarantees can I have in terms of M? Okay, and similarly for the, for the uh, sublinear case. So let me show you some simulations to give you an idea of what kind of results we should expect. Okay, so 
For the super linear case, that is when I have more cautious drivers than m equal to 1, uh, what we see is that as you increase uh, that for m equal to 2, for example, that uh, for let's say for lambda equal to 0.6, the q becomes just unstable right away. For lambda equal to 0.3, so in this case, lambda star is equal to 1. For 0.3, it, it becomes stable. Okay, and in general, what you see by simulations is that as you increase small m, this maximum lambda that you can tolerate keeps decreasing. Okay, as drivers become more cautious, the throughput of the system keeps decreasing. The question is, okay, at how does it decrease? That's what we want to understand. The interesting case is in the sublinear case, is a sublinear regime, okay, when drivers are aggressive. In this case, what we have observed to the best of our computational power so far is that no matter when you choose m less than 1, no matter what lambda you choose, the system eventually becomes stable. No, eventually, no, sorry, the system remains stable. It remains stable, okay? The, the, the value at which it might stabilize will keep increasing with lambda, but it does, does stabilize, okay? To the, again, to the, to the best of our computational power, that's what we have been able to show. Now, that's as far as simulations is concerned. What I'm going to show analytically now is provide initial condition. In fact, I'll show that if you start with an empty queue, what, with what probability will you remain stable? For this, for the superlinear regime, and for the sublinear regime, I'll show what are the initial conditions from which, no matter what your lambda is, you will remain stable with with high probability. That's what I want to show, right? That does not necessarily cover everything that we see by simulations, but 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 a lot of it. Okay. So the takeaway message from this simulation, and which will also be reflected to some extent from the analytical results, is that there apparently seems to be a phase transition as you go from a sublinear car following model to linear or superlinear car following behavior. Suddenly the throughput becomes finite. That's the message that we're get, getting. Okay? So that means you should be very aggressive. Yeah. If you see a car, you should accelerate and brake only when they're about to hit. How do you capture this behavior? I, so I'm not, so that's one of the great. <laughs> but, but so, you know, sometimes you'll find that, and that probably is just characteristic of, I find that in 4 and 12 a lot. Would not get it. So, for example, if I'm driving, there'll be some people in front of me who slow down. And they will basically cause everybody else behind them to slow down, while there's literally actually is no condition in front of them. So, unless I'm mistaken, you're referring to shock waves. Uh, so there are phenomena called shock waves where uh, if, if a vehicle, so th th there are waves, right? So once a vehicle stops and then, uh, sorry, it slows down and speeds up, that effect travels backwards in the form of shock. So if I slow down for, let's say, five minutes, there's a band of vehicle of uh, width, let's say, five minutes, which will be slowed down by the same amount, and that wave keeps moving backward. I don't know if that's that's what you're referring to. This basically this becomes constant. What happens is that actually, literally, there is no congestion on the road in front of this. Mm -hmm. It is just, and you know, I won't interrupt uh, what you kind of care of thought when you're doing, but I was just, because you were in the previous time when you were talking about the fact that everybody slows down the circular thing, right? That sometimes doesn't happen in fact. That's what I'm trying to say. But why why does not that happen? Because just because it's a natural inclination of the, of the driver in front of them, let's say there are four lanes, and every three of them block the lane just by driving slow. Let's say the takeover lanes, right? Mm -hmm. That's lanes. That's it. Like, you know, you'll find that you have to literally get past everything to actually go ahead and give it. Right. So one thing is here, this is a single lane setup, if that explains things, right? So there are no multiple lanes here. So there's a single lane, it's a one-dimensional problem, so exactly. So that is not being captured here, if, if that answers. Yes, I don't know how to model that and how to, but there you yeah. So lane changing, I can talk offline how to how to model those things. It's it's a, in general, it's it's a it's a complicated because the lane changing models are are not are behavior based models. So they're like rule based. So if the distance, it's it's not clean as the car following models here. So so even in the literature, people are still trying to come with formal clean uh, expressions for lane changing behavior yet. Uh, yeah, but this is for only for a single lane scenario, which is also the case for platooning and string stability. It's it's a single lane setup. Another like yeah. Why do you think oscillator model? Because you are taking like uh, uh, so I would imagine that I could model each one of them as oscillators, and then they are good models for that. So, I'm not, I'm not so correct me if I'm wrong, but is there literature where you? allow uh, no, addition no, of departure no so that's that's really our main thrust right so uh, we don't we want that we want that queuing aspect arrival and departure of vehicles we want it completely decentralized there is no coordination there's no way to coordinate anything right so everybody's completely autonomous and that's really what we are we are, we are at here so, 
What if you have the arrivals at a particular point? Doesn't matter. So our case considers that. In fact, many of our simulations. So, that to be derived, so right? that's what this one is. Yeah. So in most of my simulations, I'm going to show the scenario where all the arrivals happen exactly at the point of departure, like they're co-located. The vehicles have to make the entire turn to, to depart. But the results are independent of that. I mean, you can, uh, yeah. So this is like the best vehicles are taking an exit. And I was like, you have 495 and they're taking an exit. They came from some exit. They could, like, yeah. The same one. Right. So in some sense, the the if if this is not Dirac, okay. Let's say this is uh, this is a uniform distribution or some other distribution. It's a loose way of of modeling lane changing behavior in a very loose way, right? So vehicles are arriving according to uh, pro, according to distribution which is independent of the state of your system. If you allowed that in arrival process to be dependent on the state of your system, that's one way of modeling the lanes. So imagine there are two such systems in parallel, two horizontal queues in parallel, where here can join here, but in a state dependent fashion. Okay, so there are extensions possible to this model, but uh, we have not done that. And maybe we simply actually have the, this distance, not the arc, you're not talking about the arc here. No, no, it's, 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 it's arc length. Oh, this is arc length. This arc length. So circle is not really important. You can put elliptic uh, anything. It's what matters is it's a periodic uh, trajectory. So it doesn't matter if it's a circle. There's no centrifugal. So yeah, those. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to figure out. Um, so maybe you are influenced by the oscillation. Problems that come with stabilization on this kind of topology. But yeah, I think that may not be. Yeah. So you might as well have just a very long line, then a small loop, and then line back. Doesn't matter. I think. Yeah, the, the circle aspect is not really important in what I'm talking about here. Okay, what's important is that it's, it's closed, it's periodic. That's it. Okay, so le let's go ahead with uh, with uh, with my analysis, and I'll be very quick uh, now here. So the superlinear case, right? What's the problem with the superlinear case, or in general nonlinear case, that the service rate is not constant? When it was a linear case, it was constant. We could do all the nice analysis, right? But for superlinear case, it's not constant. So, but let's try to approximate my queuing system by an another queuing system, which is with constant rate. And so our approach would be to choose the appropriate queuing system with the constant rate, uh, with, with a constant service rate that, that matches well with my queuing system, right? So that's the approach that I'm going to take. And let me explain how, how I do that, okay? So the observation, I recall that for this kind of queuing system in the super linear regime, the service rate at any point is lower bounded by this expression of the queue length. Okay, this follows simply uh, based on the arguments that I presented a couple of slides ago. Which means that if I know beforehand that my queue length is not going to exceed capital N, some capital N, then I know that my service rate is going to be at least this much. Okay, So this gives me a parameterized class of constant service rate queuing systems, parameterized by capital N, which I could use which I could consider to be uh, a, a surrogate for my actual queuing system. Now what's the problem here? If I choose capital N to be too small, this constant service rate queuing system that I'm considering would actually be faster than my queuing system. What you ideally want is, is a queuing system which is just slower than your actual queuing system so that whatever service throughput guarantee that you can get from the slower system will be a guarantee for your actual queuing system. Now if you choose capital N to be very small, then there is, there is not much guarantee that your, that your constant service rate system will be slower than your real system. On the other hand, if you choose capital N to be very large, then you'll be very conservative in your estimate for your, for your throughput because for a large capital N, the service rate will be very, very small. So there's a sweet spot, right? So there's an optimal choice of this parameter capital N that you have to make in order to approximate your actual queuing system by, by an approximate system, okay? And in fact, it's pictorially shown by, by this plot where my blue system here is my actual system and my red system is, is, is an approximate system. So the blue system has this time varying cost service rate, but the red system has a constant service rate and that service rate at any point is, is in this particular example, is, is less than the service rate of the blue system. Okay, so whatever throughput guarantee I can get for the red system will be a throughput guarantee for the blue system because it's slower. Okay, now, how to choose such an appropriate n? It involves uh, some some calculations for the busy period distribution, which which uh, which I don't uh, probably it's not um, good time to go through the calculations here. But what I want to highlight here is is this picture, uh, which captures the effect that I was uh, that I was uh, mentioning before. So 
for different values of n, where again n is the parameter that I want to use to, to uh, choose an approximate queuing system, you get this interesting behavior in terms of what throughput guarantees you can get. If you choose n to be very small, you have low guarantees for throughput, and if you go very high, you have, you have again very small guarantees for throughput. So there's an optimal choice of n that if you make, then you get the best guarantee for the throughput. And indeed that is what is formalized in this, in this exam, in this, in, this, in this result, which says that fix the probability with which, uh, the likelihood with which you want your throughput to be a, a guarantee. And then you, you pick the, the, the best n uh, for which for which you can get this uh, get the appropriate guarantee so this kind of computations guaranteeing that the Q is stable uh, starting being empty under lambda and having a constant service rate of 1 over n to the power m minus 1 this kind of computations are simple if your service rate is constant uh, but these computations this result says that these computations give a, a lower bound on the throughput of your actual system Okay, and the, the point to note here is that there are parameters that you have to optimize and one of them is, is capital N. So let me illustrate this result with what you see by simulations. Okay, so in these simulations what I'm plotting is on the blue line, I'm plotting the throughput guarantee that we get from the result that I just showed before. Okay, so let's say I want throughput guarantee with 0.9 likelihood. That is if I start from an empty queue, what is the maximum lambda that I should pick so that with probability at least 0.9 my queue will remain stable. Okay, and that curve is shown by this blue one. And the other two curves are showing the confidence intervals for what you get from actual simulations. Okay, so from actual simulations, you do see that, for example, at 1.4, if your m, small m was 1.4, then what we can guarantee through analysis is that with likelihood 0.9, your throughput is at least 0.35. And the simulations show that actually the, the actual throughput is not much, not much more than that one. Okay. So the methodology that I'm proposing uh, in the previous slide is that using this way of approximating your queuing system, your complex queuing system by a simple queuing system does work indeed, indeed nice. And these simulations are for the extreme when your all the arrivals happen at one point and even when you let your arrivals happen uniformly on the ring, the, the difference is not much. Okay, the difference between the blue curve and this uh, other two curves which, which give the confidence interval of your, of your throughput by simulation. Okay. That's what I'm going to cover now. Yeah. So, uh, right. So this is for the for the superlinear case. Okay. And what you want to see is that the throughput is decreasing uh, as as m is as drivers are becoming more cautious. Okay. The sublinear case, which I call as m less than one. Uh, let me briefly explain uh, how we handle this case. Okay. So if you recall, uh, for the linear case and for the superlinear case. We use this busy period as our tool to, to handle, to do our analysis. Now it turns out that the busy period is not a good tool for, for the superlinear case because, for the sublinear case, because the busy period potentially will, does not ever end. And let me explain that using simple back of the envelope calculation. So if you are in the sublinear regime, okay, where remember the throughput is potentially infinite, okay, it's unbounded your busy period typically does not end. There is always somebody in the queuing system. Okay, so let's, in order to understand that, let's look at the workload dynamics again, the same as before. Recall that this was, this were the bounds on the service rate that I had before. Okay, so in other words, the service rate is no more than this quantity where n is the number of vehicles present in the system right now. Even in the extreme case, that is when you assume the maximum service rate in the system, the number of vehicles that you need in the system to, to handle this, this, this rate is given by this quantity, which is obtained by just setting this equal to zero, with s equal to this. And if you see this quantity, the base here has to be, is, is greater than one, uh, is, is increasing as you, as you increase lambda. So as you have higher and higher lambda, the, the number of vehicles that you need in your system to, to handle that, uh, that, that kind of a workload is also gets high and hence with very high likelihood the queue length process does not does not hit zero okay so the message that we here are getting here is that this notion of busy period is not a good tool to analyze analyze uh, the this sublinear case because the busy period does not does not end so if you try to compute the mean busy period it's infinite if you try to compute any statistics associated any reasonable statistics associated with busy period which we are doing for the previous case it's not going to be it's not going to be well posed so you need some different kind of tools here Okay, so what are the different kind of tools? And it turns out that in this case, it's the inter-vehicle distances 
those are the ones which are really helpful in getting bounds on throughput. Okay, and let me explain that again through simple calculations. Okay, so if I know that my the minimum intervehicle distance is is of this expression. Okay, so in the extreme case, so c here, which is a constant, it's typically much less than one. When c equal to one, that's the maximum value it can take. All the vehicles are equally spaced. If I know that the minimum intervehicle distance is of this kind then my service rate is at least of, of uh, is at least of this much. Now this expression is interesting because remember this is service rate. As n increases, remember small m is less than one. I have a self-stabilizing property in the system. As n increases, small n increases, meaning my Q is becoming unstable, my service rate is keeping up, is increasing, okay? So that's the self-stabilizing property of your system in the sublinear regime that you use to establish the throughput bounds for your system. Okay, so more. So there are there are, there are complications here. Uh, so so the, the one of the so the key result here, uh, without going through the details, is that we can characterize initial condition in terms of these intervehicle distances, from which we can show that with probability one, you will you will remain stable no matter what your lamb, no matter what lambda you choose. Okay, so that's that's really that's really the big result here, and and the and the the fact that we use is that the service rate it has this self-stabilizing property. If your intervehicle distances satisfy this property, okay, and uh, okay, there's much more to be said here, but let me let me move on. So so in summary, uh, this is this is the this is the picture that you get. Okay, so this is the capacity dependence dependence of capacity on the car falling behavior in your system. So on the x-axis I have small m, and on the y-axis in the left-hand side plot I have the maximum throughput. Okay, so there's a phase transition. Again, you have to take this part with a grain of salt because we have tried only up to a certain lambda, and no matter what we tried, the Q was stable, right? Whereas here, you 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 clearly see a, a gradual decrease. Okay, and and there's a corresponding uh, plot for the delay versus versus small m that you would that you would expect. Okay, now of course this plot and this 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 uh, conclusion about phase transition is dependent upon the specific model that we choose. So, but what's what the message that I want to give from this picture is that the throughput does not just depend upon the physical capacity of your system. It also depends upon what kind of car following behavior you have in place. And hence, when you have autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, this is something, this kind of plots or performance curves could be useful in, in optimizing the car following behavior. That's, that's the message that I want to give from this plot. Okay, the exact shape uh, differ, and the, the tools that we are proposing in terms of using workload as a proxy for Q length, and using this intervehicle distances distribution to characterize a service rate, are potentially useful for for that purpose. That's that's the that's the big picture here. All right, so uh, understanding that, uh, how much time do I? In theory, three minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe. Uh, so I'll just take five minutes, maybe. I won't go through all the slides, maybe. So, uh, so maybe just let me explain only this part and not go to the second half of the talk. I'll go only for those people who are interested, right? So, in queuing systems, remember for uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, with traffic flow models, there are microscopic models which describe the the. Uh, the, the state of every every vehicle in detail. And there are what are known as a macroscopic models which describe the traffic flow like a fluid. And typically those are described by PD models, okay? So when you want to understand the behavior of, trans, of a transportation system, uh, when you want to do, for example, model predictive control to decide the ramp meters or the green lights, the speed limits for the next one hour, you use some kind of approximation of these models, okay? So there has been a lot of interest in understanding what is the relationship between these models, which were inspired by fluid mechanics kind of uh, arguments, and the corresponding uh, car behavior models? Because these are related. Once you have this description, in theory, you should be able to derive these models using appropriate uh, averaging arguments. Okay. Now, the way the literature has gone is they. So, if you look at this model, this is nothing but mass balance equation, where rho is the is the density of vehicle the density density of cars on on a given uh, stretch of the road and v is the speed okay so there are two variables and one equations two variables being density and speed 
Okay, so you need, it, this, this model does not completely describe your system. You need an additional uh, relationship between the speed and, and the density. And typically, practitioners use data to come up with a phenomenological uh, law to combine, to, to establish a relationship between them to complete the description of the model. Okay, now what we are claiming is that if you, if you use the queuing theoretic fluid argument, you can possibly go from a, from your car falling model to a complete description of, of, your, of your model at the, level, at the level of PD. In other words, if you take appropriate fluid limit arguments, then you can completely specify the speed in terms of the density. Okay? And uh, what I'll describe is one tool that allows us to do that, and this is the tool that we borrow from the process sharing queue literature and which has not been applied to the transportation world. Okay? So remember, when you talk about queuing system, our queuing system is complex. In, in other words, we want, if I want to understand the evolution of my system, I want, I, in theory, I should keep track of the state of every vehicle. But since the dimension of my system itself is changing, it's, it's a very complex, complex uh, proposition to do. So the idea of measure valued state descriptor allows you to lift your state description to an infinite dimensional space. Okay, so let's say you have three cars in the system at location x1, x2, and x3. Uh, either you describe your system by a vector of size three with location of each and every vehicle, or you lift it to a distribution, a measure over your road of length zero L, which is the sum of the delta distributions at x1 and x2, s3. What you have achieved here is that independent of number of vehicles in the system, you are still in the same space. If you, if you go to this, this uh, description of your state space. Now, what are you losing? What you're losing is losing from here, for example, you cannot recover the location of any vehicle, right? You have lost that information. But fortunately, for many car following behaviors, you don't need information about the absolute location of vehicles. You need information about the intervehicular distances. You need information like how many vehicles are present in a certain stretch of the road, etc. And those information you can recover from this measure value state descriptor using simple operation. For example, if I want to know how many vehicles are present between in the interval A and B, I just take the dot product of, uh, of an indicator functions with support A, B with my, with my state descriptor row and I get the number of vehicles present, present in thing. For example, if, if my A, B was the interval zero to this point, if I take this dot product between this and this guy, I'll get the number two, okay? So you can recover the number of vehicles present in a certain stretch using this simple operation. What about intervehicular distances? Because that's a key component of car falling models. That also you can recover. So let's say I want to know how far, if, uh, how far is the next vehicle in front of a vehicle at location X2. What you do is you look for the value of Y, which is the distance in front of X2, at which this dot product becomes equal to one. At that Y, the smallest such Y is the intervehicle distance in front of you. Okay. If you want to know the vehicle distance to the second vehicle in front of you, you set this to be equal to two. Okay. So the idea here is that by moving to a, this measure value state description of your system, you avoid this time varying nature of the dimension of your system, yet you do not lose the required information to write down your model with respect to that state with description. And using that, we, so we, we, we have taken the fluid limit of uh, these models and the simulation is showing that in fact you, you get what you, what you expect, meaning the red line is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the PD that you get by taking the limit in, in the sense that I'm describing here. And the, the black curve is the corresponding uh, system for some finite, uh, not in the limiting sense, in, in for a finite, uh, finite scaling, in the finite scaling regime. Okay, so the, for those of you who are familiar with the fluid models of uh, queuing of MM1Q, this would not be surprising. I think the, surpri the, the novelty here is, is a special way of describing the state of your system that allows you to, to do that. So in theory, you could go from the car following model that you described to an appropriate PD description using, using this state value measure description. And there are ways to also use this to also incorporate lane changing behavior, for example. So in the interest of time, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll stop here. I'll just say quickly what I wanted to cover in the next part. And for those of your interest, I'm happy to, happy to discuss. Uh, so here we, we take our, our macroscopic car falling model. And what we want to do is an optimal control, okay? An optimal control of this kind. So this is my model. 
and I want to minimize, let's say, the average travel time of the vehicles subject to this model, where my control is alpha, which is, let's say, changing the speed limit. And this problem, in general, is non-convex, because the constraints that Z has to satisfy are, are non-convex, okay? So, uh, so what we do is we propose a relaxation. Uh, it's a very simple relaxation that we propose to, to make, make that problem convex. And what our result is that, and in that process of relaxation, we, 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 we set the value of control to be, to be one of the extreme values. Okay? And then what, once you get the solution to the relaxed problem, where there is no more control present in the optimization problem, you can recover a feasible solution for original problem by an appropriate control design. So that's, that's really the big picture. So in terms of practice, you solve this relaxed problem uh, for the next one hour, let's say t equal to one hour, get the solution, and then you design your speed limit according to this expression, and that's how you actuate the system. And it's an exact, exact procedure that we, that we design. Uh, there are uh, ways to, using, op using principles from optimal control, you can come up with sufficient conditions on the structure of your network and your cost function so that the, the control that you design here which in a typical in a typical uh, sense, typical scenario it's an open loop control actually becomes a, you can write as a closed loop control so you don't have to design the solution over the entire horizon but you can write as a closed form so that's that's we have identified scenarios under which that is also possible and then of course extending it to using for parallel computations using using standard procedures uh, so sorry I had to go rush through this uh, last part uh, so really the conclusion is uh, there is a way uh, what, what we are proposing here is that when with the, with the emergence of autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, there is an added, added actuation mechanism in terms of car falling models, and that can have an impact on the throughput of the system, right? And, not, and with, so that's a way to leverage, to increase the efficiency of your system without investing in physical infrastructure. And, and really, the, the, keeping aside the specifics of the model that we proposed, the role of workload and intervehicular distances are useful in, in, in coming up with those characterization. And for the second part of the talk, we, we propose uh, exact convex relaxations for standard optimal control formulations of traffic flow over networks. And in particular, we identified sufficient conditions on the network and on the cost function for which you can, you can write a feedback form of for, the, for the control. Okay, so there are several things that we are, that we are, uh, that we are doing. Uh, but more, I think the, one of the most important uh, things is uh, we neglected several things in our car falling models like the imperfect communication. We only looked at the car directly in front of it, front of us. In theory, you could have a communication network. Your car falling model would have embedded some other information structure. And in principle, uh, this kind of tools should also be applicable there, right? So how do you utilize these tools to design the appropriate information structure to maximize the throughput of your system, right? So that's something that we are, that we are interested in. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the, the traffic flow models at the macroscopic scale, uh, the original models are PDE, partial differential equations, but then you discretize them to, to be able to handle them on your computer. And there's a issue, regular issue of being consistency, right? Whether the discretization that you're coming up with is consistent with your original PDE model. And the cell transmission model, which I showed uh, briefly, is one such consistent discretization. Now that discretization was for the PD model which people have been using for ages. But the PD models that we are going to come up with when you have this intervehicle communication, intervehicle uh, communication delay, what are the what are the discretize what are the consistent discretizations? So that's something that, that we are also interested in. And finally uh, the sufficient conditions that we identified, we have just scratched the surface of what are the sufficient conditions on the network and on these cost functions for which you can find closed form control? Okay, uh, closed form decentralized control. Okay, and based on that, we are exploring uh, even constructing approximately optimal control, but in a closed loop feedback form. So rather than solving the entire problem or the entire network, is there a natural conditions under which those problems are distributed, become distributed? So what I presented was just one condition. We are interested in extending it to general case. So with that, I will I'll end my talk and. Thanks for attention. I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you.